So we finished our posters about European exploration in the Americas. We also finished up our discussions with Zinn and Schweikert. Now we're gonna be talking a bit more specifically about the Columbian Exchange itself. This idea has been mentioned in all of our previous activities so far, but this is specifically, the purpose is Columbian Exchange, okay? So we have, this is a quick little map of the empires that are spreading, the Europeans as they're colonizing. You have the so-called Old World, which is made up of Africa, Europe, and Asia. And you have the so-called New World, which is made up of what? Yeah. The Americas. Thank you. Much snappier than the last hour was. Took, they were silent for like 10 seconds. Why? Just, uh, just give the answer. So, the Columbian Exchange is the 400 years after Columbus arrives in the quote-unquote new world, and all of the things and people and objects and animals and plants that go from either old world to new world or new world to old world. So that's just a nice, quick little definition. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. I just thought this was cool. We'll come back to this later. This is a, a silver mine called Potosi. It's the largest silver mine in the world, controlled exclusively by the Spanish. And they mined it for hundreds of years and shipped all the silver back to Spain. And once in Spain, they spent it all on China. So basically, China ended up with all the silver <laughs> and all the gold as well. Uh, that's a common thread, trend. All right, so let's get into it. The first thing we're going to talk about is probably the most important thing that is exchanged from old world to new world. Anyone want to take a guess? Disease and food. Disease. Say again. Disease and food. Okay, just the one thing. Disease. Disease, thank you. <laughs> Disease spreads rapidly in the new world. Um, smallpox, uh, typhus, whooping cough, some forms of the flu. And Native Americans and Polynesians, many of them lacked immunities to these diseases. The reason for, why, why would that be? Because they've never been introduced to them. They've never been introduced to them. I mean, if we look at the map, they were completely cut off on the Pacific to the west, Atlantic to the east. So they didn't have any of these immunities that people in the old world had. And the reason why, why, why would people in the old world have all these immunities? They're constantly exposed to it. They're sharing plagues with one another constantly. They're all interacting together. Whereas in the Americas, like the Aztecs kind of kept themselves. I mean, they sent some trade up to Arizona, up to Apache and all that. But they mostly kept to themselves. Inca mostly kept to themselves. Some of the tribes in North America mostly kept to themselves. And on top of that, you know, oh, another thing is they didn't have pack animals. The Inca had the llama, that's about it. And there are certain diseases that are exchanged from people to animals and vice versa. So we have much more of that over here going on. So the Europeans, they show up and they're carrying all of these diseases. Did they know they were carrying it? No. No. So did they do this on purpose? No. No. Largely, this was an accident. And the best way that I can think of this is, imagine someone is born in a hermetically sealed bubble, like a plastic bubble or something, like, a, like one of those um, hamster balls. Yeah, like a hamster wheel, or a hamster ball. Imagine someone is born in a hamster ball, and they spend their entire life in a hamster ball, like walking around, getting stuck between desks. That'd be pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> and he spends all his time in this hamster ball, and then at the age of 18, he's walking down the street and someone with a pin comes up and pops it. What's going to happen to that kid? He's, he's, he's probably going to get sick. He might die. Thankfully, we live in a, a, a country where we have all this medical technology and we're able to catch diseases and treat them better. So he, he might live in our society, in our time period, 
But did they have that in 1500? Oh. So imagine the Native Americans are this guy who lived in this hermetically sealed ball, and the Europeans show up and they pop it. What's going to happen to the Native Americans? They're going to get sick and they're going to die en masse. Almost half the population of all of the Americas is wiped out. Some places it's 90%. Like Hispaniola, which is an island in the Caribbean, 90% of their population is wiped out. This bottom graph charts the amount of uh, people in Mexico, native population in Mexico. You can just see how quickly it declines. So 1515 at the far end on the left, fifth, sorry, 1580 on the far right. So we're talking about a course of 70 years, almost 90% of the population gone. To put that in perspective, the Black Death only killed somewhere between a third and 50%. And we're looking at this for 90%. How many people are we? 13? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All of you that I just counted are dead. It's actually not 90%, but, <laughs> but close enough. And this also happened in North America as well. So South America is getting hit really hard. North America is also getting hit. This green line up top charts it, declining. But if we're looking at just raw numbers, uh, most of the population of the Americas lived in Central and South America. So those regions, just in raw numbers, got hit the hardest. North America didn't get quite hit as hard. So these diseases are rampaging through these populations, burning through them. At the same time, the Spanish are showing up. and. Are they just there for the weekend? No. no. What do they want? Gold. They want gold. They gold. want what else? Slaves. Slaves. What else? Glory. Land. Glory. God. Come on. Land. So they get lands. They want the territory. They want to set up colonies. They're not just there for the weekend. They're there forever. In their minds, this is free real estate. All they have to do is kill some people to get it. To get it. <laughs> So they come in and they have guns and steel and armor and horses and cannons and on and on and on. And in a fight between the natives and the Spanish, who has the advantage? Spanish. Spanish. You have a fight between a guy with a gun and a guy with a spear, who's going to win? Nine times out of ten, guy, guy with the gun is going to win. Now. Imagine, you have a guy with a gun and a guy with a spear, and the guy with the spear has the flu. Now who's going to win? Even harder. 95% of the time they're going to win. So they, they cut through the Native American population. The Native American population, they get hit with just two big whammies right in a row. Two big uppercuts. And the Spanish, they're there for the gold and the land and the plantations and sugarcane and, and silver and all of that. This is all back-breaking, hard work. So who are you going to get to do it? Slaves. Slaves from where? Africa. Not yet. Native Americans. Native Americans. Because they're there, right? Why buy, why buy people from Africa if you have people right here, you know? And so that goes back to that Potosi drawing that I showed you at the beginning, remember? Everyone that worked there was a Native American slave. And Potosi was big business for the Spanish. Now then, you have this slave population, this labor force, working the sugar cane, working the mines, and they're also dying off from these diseases. So your, your labor pool is declining. What then do you do? Then you go to Africa. Then you go to Africa. And this is really the start of the transatlantic slave trade, that triangle trade that you probably learned about. Because the Spanish needed a labor force because the Native Americans were dying out so too quickly. 
So they would capture people. Well, actually, they would actually buy them from African slavers. So Africans capturing Africans to sell them to Europeans. That's mostly what the slave trade consisted of. But they would capture people, put them on these boats, jam-packed, nice and tight, send them on a week, six weeks long journey, depending on the weather conditions, across the Atlantic. Now, 14 million Africans were captured and sold into slavery and put onto these ships. 14 million. 10 million made it. 4 million didn't. 4 million people over the course of 400 years died on this trip. That's So if you were just freshly captured and put onto one of these ships, you would have a hold on. You'd have a 29% chance of dying. I did the math. That's worse odds than Russian roulette. In Russian roulette, you have an 18% chance of dying. They capture these people by the millions. Now, for the next part of this conversation, I will admit it's uncomfortable, but I'm going to talk in a way that is uncomfortable, but I just want to make it clear that this is how the Europeans thought about it. If that makes sense. So I'm not, I'm not trying to say anything insensitive. I'm just trying to think, think about it from the Europeans' point of view during that time period. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So if you were a European slaver, how would you maximize your profit? Capture more slaves. Capture more slaves. How, okay, how about this? How would you make it so more people made it across the Atlantic? So capture more slaves, that'll be part of it. Better boats. Better boats, yeah. What else? Maps and stuff. Well, yeah. Maps. Well, that's a given. Yeah. Food. Food for who? Slaves. Why would you? Well, do you have enough room for food for a whole bunch of slaves on your ship? No. No. So what else could you do? Let me rewind. What else could you do? Oh, pack them up. Pack them up. It's called uh, an economies of scale. Walmart buys in bulk. That's why they're able to offer cheaper prices. So in the same way, many of these slavers start buying in bulk and trying to jam pack them as tightly as possible. And if you do that, do you, do you definitely have, sorry, if you do that, do you have room for food and water for them? No. But we're thinking about this as an evil European slaver. Do they care? No. no. Now, that being said, do, does the European expl uh, slaver expect all of them to live? No. When I worked at Walmart, uh, you know, every week or so, there would be trucks coming into the back that had to be unloaded, you know, like cabbages and TVs and eggs. The shipping company, Walmart, do they expect every single egg to be okay? No. No. Something called breakage. If they actually factor it into their when they purchase things, it's called breakage. They expect a certain number of eggs to be broken. In the same way, the European traders expected a certain number of slaves to die. But so that's just economies of scale. And again, I know it's uncomfortable to speak this way. It makes me uncomfortable especially since we're talking about human beings, but this is the way they thought about it. Now, to be fair to the Europeans, they did try to find a way, hold on. So if, you are, if you're trying to make sure that enough slaves make it over and live, what might you do? What might you look for? Safer passages, places Some where you're Okay, so take for passages, I guess. But it's, it's the ocean. Yeah, I guess. Can't only like one place to go. Mm -hmm. Stronger slaves. Stronger slaves. So you'd look for, would you look for healthier people? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So they would often look for teeth, 
look at look at the health of the teeth. They look at musculature, see how strong someone is. Look at back muscles, things like that. Look for healthy people. What else might you look for if you were an evil, terrible young, young people? Maybe not kids, but younger people. You'll want to bring grandma on this trip because she's probably not going to make it, and that's a waste of your money. What else? There's one more thing that you probably would never think of. Okay. Pregnant so, people. say again? Pregnant people. Why would you bring pregnant people? Because the baby's like protected inside. Are you sure, man? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I mean, like if you're on the outside. What? <laughs> <laughs> when you're pregnant, you can't lay on your back. I didn't know that. Well, now you do. No, I don't. <laughs> How are you supposed to lay then? You have to lay on your side. Why can't you lay on your back? Because you're, okay. So as the baby grows in the uterus, the uterus gets larger and it puts more and more weight on, on down and can actually cut off blood supply. So you have to sleep on like your side? Yeah. You actually have to sleep on your left side because your right side has an artery that goes up your leg, back to your heart. So they don't want you sleeping there because you might cut off circulation there. So you have to sleep on your left side. <laughs> I know all this because I had a kid. Anyway, there's one other thing that many European traders looked for. This is probably something that you probably have never heard of or would even think of. So this is a European trader inspecting a slave. Can anyone tell what he's doing? Teeth? He's not, well, he's we've already mentioned teeth. He's licking him. So European slavers, they would go to the slave market and they would try to lick people's foreheads to see, hmm, that one's not as salty. Okay, this one's pretty salty. So they were tasting the sweat to see how salty the sweat is. And the reason for that is they found that the saltier the sweat, the more likely that person was going to survive. I don't know why. I'm not a doctor. They probably didn't know why either. They just did it. So they were taking millions of people, and the people that were most likely to get across had saltier sweat. Now, of course, there's, I'm not a doctor, but there's all sorts of factors that go into how salty your sweat is, like cholesterol, heart health, you know, genetic factors, and so on and so forth. But because of this, and this part is fascinating, because of this, this has led to a very clear and scientifically proven disparity between African Americans and everyone else. Heart disease death rates among persons aged less than 65 years old. Anything stand out to you? Thank you. I don't know why. <laughs> Why was there such a long pause? Look at this. Look at this. Is that a small difference? Like double. It's like double. African Americans are more likely to die from heart-related problems, probably because of going back to the slavers looking for people with the saltiest sweat. So this is a very, very clear and scientifically proven Disparity resulting from the slave trade. So they killed all the healthy slaves, and so it was left with the people with problems with their hearts? No, it, it has to deal with the, the salt, mm -hmm. the salt and the sweat. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So they were more likely to survive the passage, but then they had you know, cholesterol issues that they passed down to their children. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, for white men, the risk of hypertension is 23%. For African American men, it is 45%. For white women, it's 18%. For black women, it's 39%. So it's double between whites and blacks. Before the age of 50, the risk of heart failure for African Americans is 20 times higher than whites. And that can be very, very directly traced back to the slave trade. Any questions about slave trade? Okay. But there are also some positives. So we talked about disease and slavery. 
there were also there were a lot of new world plants that became available. Corn, sweet potato, which is disgusting, and potato, which is wonderful. Sweet potato is awful. Don't even try to defend it. It's bad unless you have sweet potato fries. Okay, no, it's true. It's true. It's true. French fries are better. Sweet French fries are better, but sweet potato fries are okay. If French fries are better, then why would you get sweet potato fries? Because you have like a I don't know, district. There's a fry shortage. <laughs> So corn, sweet potato, potatoes, they all came from the Americas. They're all native to the Americas. And they get transported back to the New World, or sorry, the Old World, rather. What, what kind of impact do you think that might have? Just moving it around, like the impact of moving it. Okay, so people take potatoes, and they take them to Ireland, what are the Irish going to do with it? Farm them. Farm, more farm it. And then they're going to do the same thing in Poland, in Germany, in France, in Russia. What impact would that have? It makes more foods different, like mixtures of foods that come from. Good, so more variety in diet. There's more food, which would lead to what? Surplus. Say a uh, surplus of food, yeah. which would lead to what? Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, say it loud. Population increase. Population increase. Why? Because there's more food. People aren't starving to death. Children are more likely to survive. You know, imagine that you're a farmer in Poland in 1400. All you have is wheat. That's it. And it's fall. You can feel the nip of winter about to come on. And then you realize. The wheat is sick. The wheat has a disease, and your entire wheat crop is wiped out. What's going to happen to you and your family? You, you, will, you will starve. But now, fast forward to 1500 <laughs> or 1550, you're a farmer in Poland, and you've got wheat and potatoes and maybe a little bit of corn, and you're, you're, you've got multiple things going on. Now what happens if the wheat crop gets wiped out? You got, the potatoes. Potatoes. you got the potatoes and the corn and the corn and whatever else and whatever else. So you're more likely to survive the winter with your children, which would lead to population boom. So those that's an example of things coming from the new world to the old world. There's also animals moving from the old world to the new world. For instance, horses and cattle. <laughs> What's going on with that cow? <laughs> now this is significant because, sorry, listen, yeah. This is significant because in the New World, there were not really any pack animals. The Inca had the alpaca and the llama, but those are relatively small animals. You only really carry like 100 pounds at a time. Um, so by bringing over these new animals, they're able to do more agricultural work, maybe do more construction and things like that. They're able to you know, set up carts and build roads and things like that. So that's a significant exchange. <laughs> Any questions? What's going on with the cow? Yeah. <laughs> Here's just a quick little list of all the things that were swapped, where they started and where they ended up. Does anything stand out to you or Disease. surprising? Diseases. Diseases. Uh, smallpox, influenza, typhus, malaria, measles, diphtheria, whooping cough. I see that tobacco went, like, was, went to Europe after this. Yeah. Was there problems from that? Well, what do you think? Well, yeah, but like, <laughs> I'm curious what they were. Well, what's, what's the, what, what, uh, what can happen if you use tobacco? Like lung cancer. Lung cancer. Yeah. Lung disease. Millions of people have died from smoking-related illnesses. No. But it was big business. Wait, honeybees aren't, weren't in the Americas no. at all? Soon they won't be again. <laughs> oh. Wait, wait, but then how did like, flowers survive? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I don't know. Perhaps there was a, an American variant of the bee, but it wasn't a honeybee. 
Um, and plus, are bees the only pollinators? No, no. no. there's birds. Mm -hmm. And butterflies and things like that. And butterflies and pollinate? Yeah. Yeah. Why, well, why yeah. would they? I don't know. They fly from flower to flower, don't they? <laughs> How they just migrated, and that's pretty much <laughs> 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 All right. Oh, one other thing. So we have this long list of diseases that went from the old world to the new world, but there's at least one disease that went from the old world to the new world. And it, yeah? Wait, I'm going to get the disease. What is it? Syphilis. Yes. It is syphilis, which is a venereal disease, also nicknamed a sailor's disease. What is a venereal disease? Venereal disease is also known as an STI, sexually transmitted infection, sexually transmitted disease. It was called the sailor's disease because Portuguese sailors would make port and then they would immediately go to whorehouses and then they move around like that. That's how it spread. <sighs> so that's at least one example of a disease going from old world to new world. Bananas are native to the old world, but they grow very well in Guatemala and El Salvador. Turkeys are native to the North America. I think that's about it. Any questions, any comments? All right, moving on then. Here's a cut, a wood cut from the 16th century showing Aztecs suffering from smallpox, dealing with the disease. So let's talk about some environmental impacts of everything that the Europeans are doing. So one major impact from you know, bringing over these animals, starting up these huge plantations, settling down and building new cities and towns is that we get we see a lot of soil erosion. You know, clear cutting a tropical rainforest. Once you clear cut a tropical rainforest, is there anything holding the soil? No. And the soil in tropical rainforests is actually very nutrition poor, which means it's not very dense and it'll it'll dissipate. It'll slide away. We also have Lots of deforestation as the Spanish and the Portuguese are clearing away all of this wood and growth in order to build cattle ranches and sugar cane plantations and eventually tobacco plantations, banana plantations, on and on and on. Also the environmental impact of running a mine, things like that. In North America, there's a thriving fur trade. Um, especially with the French in, along the Louisiana River. No, not the, what was it? Mississippi River. Um, along the Mississippi River up into Quebec and Canada. Beavers, various pelts. Has anyone seen The Revenant? Raise your hand. No one in here has seen The Revenant? My mom will let you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Leo won an Oscar finally for that movie. He ate a heart. Ugh, okay. Yes, he ate an actual wait, heart. Wait, is that the one where he's like um, in the Arctic? Well, not the Arctic, but like he's in the snow and like he's alone. I don't know. Perhaps. I'm trying to. Was he attacked by a bear? Yeah. Yeah, that movie. Okay, I've seen oh, that. I've seen that. Okay, finally. I think he has an Oscar. He has an Oscar? Oh my goodness. Wait, yeah, who? Leo DiCaprio. Oh. How dare you? You guys don't watch me. I realize this. Your generation doesn't watch movies unless it's like Avengers. Unless it's like, not oh, who cares? It has to be on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much money. That's why we have history and cinema as an assignment. So that we force you to watch some movies. Oh, is it on Netflix? Netflix? Anyway, Revenant is a very good movie, and it's about fur trappers. At least the first part of it is about fur trappers. And then, of course, we have slavery. Millions and millions of Africans being brought into North America, into Mexico, into Cuba, uh, South America, all over the place. Brazil. Brazil is 
there's a very large uh, African descent population. It is primarily to work on plantations, for instance, sugarcane. The sugarcane harvesting is very back-breaking, tedious work. You have to be basically lean, lean, leaning over the entire time, hacking away at these thick poles with a machete for hours and hours, or 12-hour days. Back-breaking work. And then, you know, refining the sugar, so like these giant pots of boiling, roiling sugar, like basically sugar water almost. Sometimes that would spill over and burn people alive and things like that. Absolutely horrific. Any questions? No? Does anyone need this slide still? Okay. With that out of the way then, that ends our PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, I think it's my shortest one. Please get to work on your cool down. What are two to three things that were swapped? And then in your estimation, was it a net positive or a net negative for the world as a whole? What do you think of like both ways? Then make